Hello, everyone. Welcome to session seven of LTEC 676. Quiet. Hello, everyone. Welcome to session seven of LTEC 676. I want to start today's video by thanking you for submitting version two of your concept maps. Here they are, and as you can see, they represent another significant effort to try and capture and organize the big ideas of the last few weeks of the course. I feel there are some notable differences in how you organized your maps this time around. And in particular, I appreciate how you labeled and linked the various concepts within your maps. In my mind, these linkages speak to the complexity of the topics we've been covering this semester. So well done. Now, one thing I want to talk about is related to next week or week eight. This week, of course, is week seven. But in week eight, I'd like to invite all of you to an optional synchronous session. This will be an opportunity for the class to come together as a group to talk about what we've been learning in the class. I know everyone is busy, so I've created a doodle poll with 15 different hour-long time slots. So when you get a chance, please fill out the poll and then I'll select the time that works for the most people. Ideally, we'll find a time that works for everyone, although that may not be possible. But let's give it a try. There's nothing to prepare in advance for this session, and it's totally voluntary. The idea is to carve out some time together as a group so we can bond and talk about what we've been learning about the social and ethical issues in educational technology. Think of it as a bonus synchronous session to complement this online asynchronous class. Okay, let's move on. In this session, we're going to transition from theme to technology and equity in schools to start talking about racial and ethnic divides, differences in needs, which will be our third theme of the semester. And to do this, we're going to shine a light on some of the underlying social problems that we talked about in the beginning of the semester. I want to talk about Von Dake's individualistic versus relational notions of inequality. And Von Dake explained that research has shown that differential access to technology is related to individuals and their characteristics, such as level of income, their education, employment, age, sex, and ethnicity. However, Von Dake argues that relational notions of inequality are just as important. From this perspective, the prime units of analysis are not individuals, but the positions of individuals and the relationships between them. In other words, inequality is a matter of individual attributes and categorical differences between groups of people. And he argues that in each of these categories, the dominant category is the first to adopt new technologies. So why does this matter? Well, the dominant category is the first to adopt new technologies. And it uses this advantage to increase power in its relationship with the subordinate category. For this reason, inequality becomes a systemic or structural characteristic of societies. And of course, we can think about how this relates to different notions of the digital divide and to issues of fairness and inclusion when we're talking about equity in terms of educational technology. Another important concept that Von Dijk shares with us is his resources and appropriation theory, which he lays out with this five-part diagram. And the logic of the theory goes like this. First, there are categorical inequalities in a society. And those categorical inequalities produce an unequal distribution of resources. Of course, we should be thinking about our graphical metaphor and the distribution of resources. The next step is an unequal distribution of resources causes unequal access to digital technologies. And importantly, unequal access to digital technologies also depends on the characteristics of those technologies, such as their price, their complexity, their popularity. Next, unequal access to digital technologies brings about unequal participation in society. Ultimately, unequal participation in society reinforces categorical inequalities and in unequal distributions of resources. In other words, it's a vicious cycle of reinforcement. 
So with that background, I want to talk a little bit about how the computer became such an important part of society and our efforts to educate one another. And to do that, we need to go back to the 1980s. And here's the cover of Time Magazine from January 1983. You can see the tagline of this is, The Computer Moves In. And the idea here is this is the time when the personal computer sales began to skyrocket. And of course, schools in the U.S. began purchasing computers at an unprecedented rate for a new technology. You can see here on the left the quote that during the 1980s, public school systems and universities across the United States threw themselves headlong into the PC revolution, investing hundreds of millions of dollars in computer systems, accessories, and software. And of course, for-profit companies also played a role in this. They worked closely with schools to sell millions of computers. They saw that as a huge install base in which they could flood the schools with educational titles. So how were computers used in the schools back then? Well, some of you actually experienced this firsthand. There were multiple streams of computer use. One use was to focus on computers across the curriculum. This idea that computers could be used in different subject areas, from mathematics to English literature to science. Another big category was this idea of computer science. Everyone believed that computers were very powerful and computer science was a new field, so we need to start focusing on training the next generation of computer scientists. Another major focus was on programming and mathematics. Many researchers and scholars and educators believe that programming and the logic involved in programming and telling a computer what to do was a way of unveiling or unmasking some of the complexities of mathematics. It would make math very accessible to more people. Of course, another way that it was used was the use of word processors, mainly for secretarial studies students. Logo, the programming language was very popular, and that was not so much to teach computer science or mathematics, but as a way of emphasizing logic and learning how to sequence and be very deliberate in your thinking. That was kind of a form of problem solving that was introduced to schools. And then finally, there was a lot of emphasis on the computer industry and business training in technical schools. So those were all of the ways in which computers were used in schools back in the 80s. And as a result, there was a flood of research conducted on how to use computers effectively. And before long, equity became a concern. Now, why was equity a concern? Well, there was concern over the inferior state of education in the U.S. relative to other nations. There was acknowledgement of changing demographics. The workforce was increasingly consisting of women and people of color. And there was also the belief that computer competence was the fourth basic skill necessary for future workers. It wasn't just reading, writing, and arithmetic. It was also computer competence. So for all of these reasons, many, many people believed that the education system needed to be reformed. And because of that, there was a flood of research. Now, one example of this research was an article by Rosemary Sutton that came out in 1991. The title of this article was Equity in Computers in the Schools, a Decade of Research. So this was published in 1991, but she was reflecting on what had happened in the 1980s. Now, importantly, she argues in that article that assessing equity and equality in schools involves three perspectives. The first perspective is looking at inputs, what schools start with when educating students. And these inputs include financial, physical, and human resources. The second dimension has to do with processes. This is what happens within schools when students are educated. In other words, how students are treated by teachers and what courses they're offered. And the third perspective is outcomes. What are the results achieved by schools, such as standardized test scores, graduation rates, and college enrollment rates? So Rosemary Sutton's article really helped us think about equity and equality in schools using these three perspectives. So what I want to do now is compare Rosemary Sutton's findings from 1991 to Warshower's finding in 2010 and ask the question, 
what's changed. And we'll do that by looking at inputs, processes, and outcomes. So in terms of input, Sutton reported major differences in race, class, and gender differences in terms of access. She noticed that there were big differences in the number of students per computer. She also noted home differences in access for boys and girls that were large and consistent. Families of male students were more likely to own a computer than families of female students, and boys were three times as likely as girls to attend a summer computer camp. Now, what did Warshower find? Well, he and his colleagues reported that progress has been made in extending home internet access to low-income and minority households. However, gaps based on income and race still remain. He also reported that around 30% of Native Americans have broadband access compared with 69% of Asian Americans, and only 18% of low-income households have broadband access compared with 90% of high-income households. Warshower also reported that access to technology is not a binary division between information haves and have-nots, but rather there are differing degrees and types of access. And he points out that many low-income or immigrant youth will have few friends or relatives who are sophisticated users of digital media. So clearly, we're seeing progress, but still there are differences and gaps based on income and race. And of course, this influences what schools start with when educating students. The next category is analysis of processes, or what happens within schools when students are educated. Sutton reported race, class, and gender differences in terms of types of use. Looking at the 1981-82 NAEP science assessment found that only 7% of students in Title I schools were taking programming. However, 14% of students in non-Title I schools were taking programming. In addition, data from a 1982-83 national survey revealed that 13% of high SES, predominantly white schools, reported intensive drill and practice, whereas 33% of predominantly minority schools reported intensive drill and practice use of computers in schools. In addition, Sutton reported that girls were underrepresented at elementary, middle, and high school programming, at game playing, and before and after school use of computers. In contrast, nearly 30 years later, Warshower reported that there are now two primary categories of online practices. Friendship-driven practices involving hanging out with peers online or interest-driven activities involving communicating, game-playing, and sharing of media. And Warshower also reported that teachers in low SES schools used a disproportionate amount of time to teach hardware and software operations, and they were reluctant to sign homework that required out-of-school access to the internet. So again, we're seeing progress, but we're still seeing differential processes when it comes to what happens with technology and how this influences how students are educated. Next, I want to talk about analysis of outcomes, the results achieved by schools, and Sutton reported race, class, and gender differences in computer competence. There were gender differences found in the 1980s in computer competence in 7th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. Students who had more experience using computers were more competent in their knowledge about computers and in their use of computers. One study reported that pupils who had computers at home believe that more of their learning about computers was done at home than at school. And boys outperformed girls in programming commands, program composition skills, and debugging of computer programs. What did Warshower find? Well, he draws on the fire metaphor of information technology, this idea that computers are expected to just radiate learning. Warshower points out that the most persuasive evidence that access to computers raises standard academic outcomes, such as grades, test scores, comes from home rather than school settings. In addition, Warshower reports that one study reported that minorities and low SES students were less likely to have a home computer, and even when they did, they, as well as females, received less academic benefit from having one compared to white, high SES and male students. And he also reported that studies suggest that drill and practice activities favored in low SES schools tend to be ineffective, whereas the use of technology disproportionately 
passionately used in SES schools achieve positive results. So my question for you is this, where are we today as we head into the spring of 2023? What would we say? And how are new technologies affecting relative inequalities as measured by those inputs, processes, and outcomes? Okay, that's all the time we have for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.